Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Hello viewers. Welcome once again to my channel. You're watching my channel, Muhammad Ati Kanwar, and education to, uh, for, <coughs> for us all. Excuse me. So you find me in the outdoors uh, once again, and today I'm covering a, a special event which uh, happens every year. It's an open day at a historical cemetery known as the Lister Lane Cemetery. So, I mean, there used to be a TV program called History on Our Doorsteps, and this is really history on our doorsteps. There is so much to learn from places such as like this. So today there's a guided tour, and I shall try and capture that as much as I can. So. Uh, Nazreen Khusham Deed, my name is Muhammad Ati Kanwar, and you can see my channel Muhammad Ati Kanwar and Education for us all. Today I am one time outdoors, and I have seen a place where I have seen you many times, and this is very historic. This is the here is a very big Kabristan, and here is the place where people have seen you. They say, they say, they say, they say, they say, गाइड होगा वो टॉक करेंगे तो मैं कोशिश करूंगा जी अगर हुआ तो ट्रांसलेट करूंगा अगर नहीं तो नहीं बिना सब समझा तो फिर सॉरी इंग्लिश में ही इंग्लिश में ही होगा ओके जी कैमरे की रुख तब्दील करते हैं तो दिखाते हैं हम कहाँ हैं सो आई टर्न द कैमरा राउंड एंड शो यू वेयर वी आर सो दिस इज लिस्ट we're at this side of the cemetery previously i have shown you it from gibbet street but as you can see it is opposite the uh, crossley residence in my time it used to be known as bellevue and now it is known as crossley house okay so i'll show you some of the signage that is here so it is actually uh, uh, what's known as a Commonwealth uh, more grave, uh, more sorry war grave, and you know as as such it contains uh, many graves from the Commonwealth. Okay, so Nazrin ye haji Lister Lane is part of her Crossley's residence. Just just say, today Crossley House ka jata hai, to pehle isko um, uh, Bellevue ka jata tha. ये जो कब्रिस्तान है इसे कॉमनवेल्थ वॉर ग्रेव्स भी कहा जाता है क्योंकि यहाँ के जो कॉमनवेल्थ कंट्रीज हैं जिन पर ब्रिटानिया ने हकूमत की उनके भी ग्रेव्स हैं अच्छा जी अंदर जाते हैं तो इंतजामिया से बात करने की कोशिश करते हैं नजरिन हम बहुत खुशकिस्मत हैं कि हम हमारे लिए ये जेंटलमैन जो हैं ये इनका नाम है डेविड ग्लवर तो ये इस दारे के चेयरमैन हैं तो इन इन काइंडली ये इंटरव्यू देंगे सो व्यूअर्स वेरी आई एम रियली रियली डिलाइटेड द द व्हाट कैन वी से द मेन मैन द पर्सन हुस सेट अप दिस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फ्रेंड्स ऑफ Upward Lane Cemetery is glad is going to give us a, a little bit uh, of information by way of introduction. So we we will ask him about the organisation and how people can get involved. David, good afternoon and welcome. It's good to see you here again. Thank you for coming. We have an open day to learn about some of the people who were buried here in this cemetery today. On a Sunday in June, when the weather is not much like summer, but we don't worry <laughs> about that. Typical. The Friends of Lister Lane Cemetery was founded 25 years ago and has been a public charity for most of that time. And in that era, we have done a lot of reclamation of a Victorian cemetery, which was in a situation we might call a wilderness or a jungle. And since that time, we've tried to cut back a lot of undergrowth, get new gates put back on the cemetery, put information boards and seats around the place, and try and interpret what we do here. So we have a website, we also have a Twitter feed, or it should be an X feed, X -feed. Of course, now, which we tweet and tell people about various people buried here. And today it's going to be- And Facebook as well, don't forget Facebook, Facebook David. Facebook. Mm. So it, it's the Friends of Lister Lane Cemetery, and we're just a small group trying to keep our 
control over a small patch of land which was really out of control and it's now under control. But oh, we have to bear excellent. in mind also that there are other aspects. We have to be aware of the green aspect that we have to maintain a suitable environment for creepy crawlies and small <laughs> animals. So we can't have everything pristine and tidy and very neat, but we do our best to compromise between the two. And there's a lot of maintenance to get things balanced. Of course. Can you tell us about how people can, can get involved? Yes. and what? You... Yes. We have a small team of workers who help us with gardening work of different kinds. We have all sorts of jobs to do, from mowing and strimming through to light gardening, and also doing a little bit of research into the families and the people buried here. Wow. So we're constantly looking for new volunteers, and if you're interested, we'd be most glad to hear from you. Excellent. So you can have a look. You'll find us online under Lister Lane Cemetery in various guises. Thank you very much, David. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I hope you found that um, a very useful um, viewers from uh, um, Mr. Glover, David Glover. So there are various uh, plaques of information in the uh, cemetery. This one is dedicated to the Crossley family and all the contribution that they have made to Halifax. Nazarene Omidia, Mr. Glover, ki talk Malumati Huyogi. So, this cemetery may ase plaques both say the Kayajange, Jo Yanki Tarik, Bitate, ye a famous family, and Yako Kitni Dafa is Kebare Mibita, a crossly family, Jinki Rihashbi, Niche, Uske Bareme, or those uh, plaques be uh, both the plaques and your information that they so I'll just pan around once again so just as we come in this plaque is here and then of course you know there are many many graves and the, uh, you know one of the things that we uh, that is here is the Crossley uh, uh, plot so all the Crossley family is is buried in, in these graves here and I think there is uh, room for, for one or two more and if we can just catch in that direction we will go uh, closer later but there you can see the remnants of a chapel that used to uh, house the uh, coffins before the service Nazreen Yaham Das Mene Pataya Bhot Se Log Dafnayu Hain Gareeb Se Lekar Kya Kya Hain Bhot Bade Bade Industrialists so, as I told you, there was an industrialist family that was called Crossleys. So, this area is all of that family. So, here they are found. If you look at this side, there is a church like a building. It is a chapel. And there was a coffin in the first place. In the main cemetery, our summer open day on a piping hot day, wall to wall sunshine, we are enjoying ourselves and we're going to enjoy ourselves whatever the weather throws at us. Thank you all for coming, it's good to see you, it's good to see some new faces as long as, uh, you know, you can come as many times as you like and we've seen a few before and it's lovely that you come back again, that's excellent. So in a short while, Stuart and I are going to lead two separate tours and I hope we can agree to divide into two little groups and one of us will go in one direction and the other will go in the other direction and never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. See how we go. So the cemetery here was opened at the end of 1841. It's not a municipal cemetery. It's a cemetery that was founded by a private company, a group of people locally who found that their chapels were filling up, their chapel yards and their churchyards were filling up in the centre of Halifax, and they decided to found a cemetery away from the centre of the town, in fact, on the edge of the countryside, if you can imagine that, in the 1830s, 1840s, hardly any buildings around here then. So they bought three acres, basically, and they, the top section they honeycombed with vaults. The lower section, they carted a lot of the earth from making those vaults down to the lower section and leveled the land 
down more as you'll see as we go around. So two sections and the top section on the whole tends to have the more affluent people buried with the more appealing, if you like, ornate monuments. You will notice, and it's important I mention this to you now, that we have a red and white tape across some of our paths. This is for safety, health and safety, simply because we have an issue with the safety of the remains of the chapel building. At the turn of the year, more or less New Year's Eve, there was a big storm and it brought down some stone from the far side and it means we can't go close to the chapel until the council, who still own this cemetery, repair it. And they have promised to, so we're thankful for that. But we wait to see when it will be. So there are sections, unfortunately, we can't venture today, but never mind. The cemetery flourished through the latter part of the 19th century. By 1900, it was fairly full. Nearly all the plots were taken, and most of the burials thereafter were in graves which were already owned by people and just a few new ones. So little space, and by the 1950s, the cemetery company um, was basically defunct. It went into liquidation, and the Calderdale, or the forerunner of the Calderdale Council, Halifax Borough Council, took it over, and it became just another cemetery. And it was not really well looked after. It had issues around the fact there were hardly any people wanting to be buried here by that time. And so, by 1963, a decision was made to close it. And the very final burial here in this cemetery took place in this grave right next to me here, Catherine Ratkowski. She was the last person buried here in the spring of 1963. No more burials since. After that time, the site got abandoned, the whole area became uh, basically derelict, and the situation was it became more or less a no-go area, crime was rampant, the gates had disappeared, and it was a mess. Mike has some pictures to circulate, um, two pictures to circulate of what the cemetery looked like before 2000 when the Friends Group was founded. Harriet Dell, who was our founder, along with one or two others, uh, founded a small group which became a charity and had this site registered as an historic park and garden, grade two. That gave it some protection because at that time in the 1990s, there were issues around it possibly being redeveloped, either completely flattened to become a car park with, a, say, a supermarket or whatever. Anyway, that didn't happen because Harriet Dell got the Friends of Lister Lane Cemetery together just 25 years ago, and we worked from there to get this place up and running again. It's not a pristine garden. We have to account for the fact there are small birds and beasties and little tiny creepy crawlers as well. We have to allow for them to live and places for them to go. And so it's a balancing act. It's a green lung in west central Halifax. We aren't open every day. At the moment we have issues around the safety of the chapel, so we're having to be closed most of the time. Normally we're open on a Sunday morning and on a Wednesday. We run simply as volunteers. And when I talk about volunteers, um, I must say that we've been working hard on this site for many years and then last year we were very gr grateful to be awarded the King's Award for Volunteer Service. Mike has a sheet about that which he will circulate. Can you make sure that the sheet gets back to, all the sheets get back to Mike at the end please? Thank you. So we had an event down at the Town Hall in March where the Lord Lieutenant presented us with a very fine crystal pillar engraved with the king's award on us and down to london went sue and i in may for the buckingham palace garden party which was very special we were um, a bit overwhelmed by it all and we were only representing dozens of other people who've put many many hard hours of work into this site so we are looking for volunteers all the time to help keep this site running 
and I'm glad to say we've got one or two new ones recently. Anything from light gardening to slightly heavier work, pushing a mower and so on. Some of it's quite straightforward. That some of it's a bit less straightforward. But if you're interested, we'd be very glad to hear from you. So I'm David Glover and I'm the present chair of the Friends of Lister Lane Cemetery. Stuart is the manager of the site and we're both going to lead separate tours. Um, Stuart's going to go in that direction, I'm going to go in this direction and I hope we can agree to split into reasonably similar numbers so that neither of us just has sort of two to walk around with, with hopefully. Um, Stuart, did you want to say a few words about your topic? Um, simple. So viewers, we've chosen Stuart, sorry Stuart, what's your surname? Wilkinson. Stuart Wilkinson, and he's going to cover sad death, so let him introduce it a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to go around the cemetery uh, talking about the interesting sad deaths. And, oh uh, wow. And that's it really. Thank you. <laughs> so can you give us an example of an interesting death? <laughs> you will see them, <laughs> okay. uh, several of them. Thank you. The one we have is called Thomas Dodgson here and uh, on the 24th of April 1858 there was a fatal carriage accident in Halifax and uh, the inquest said a fatal accident happened to Mr Thomas Dodgson, wool stapler and blanket manufacturer through a collision with a runaway horse. Oh. The deceased gentleman was standing near his warehouse reading a placard on the wall and did not see the danger. He was warned by a person nearby but being old and deaf did not hear the warning. He died that evening of concussion of the brain caused by the injury received. The horse with carriage attached did other injury but none of these were of a fatal nature. The career of the horse was halted by collision with a street corner. Oh dear. <laughs> the carriage belonged to Mr Morris of Woodhall and the horse took fright when the wife of the owner was making a purchase in Silver Street. You can just imagine, can't you, you know, going down into the centre of town in your horse and carriage mm. to buy a bonnet or whatever. Uh, it is fortunate that there was no one in the carriage and the coachman narrow, narrowly escaped with his life and a verdict of accidental death was returned. Well, uh, I will point the grave out. This grave here is James Aubrey Fielding who died on the 3rd of March 1879 and a death from drowning. An inquest was held on Wednesday last at the Carpenter's Arms in Austin, touching the death of Mr. James Aubrey Fielding of Prospect House, Osset. Sarah Bailey said she was the housekeeper up to the deceased who has suffered a great deal from attacks of rheumatism. He had been confined to bed for nearly three weeks, but on Saturday the 1st he got up seemingly much improved. He went out and returned all right. He raised early on Monday and went to business. Witness was not aware of anything to depress or trouble him. Nanette Fielding gave similar evidence and John Deanley said he had seen him in his office, where witness was a cashier. On the day in question, and later on in the day, he saw him standing by the riverside about half a mile below the works and dressed as he had last seen him, but without his hat. Deceased had been annoyed at having to pay a portion of the cost of repairing Horbury Bridge. A little girl called Asenath Richardson spoke to say, to say deceased trying to pull a stake out of a sloping bank of the river bank but he did not she did not see him fall in george berman of vulcan road Dewsbury, said he was going along the edge of the river near low mill when he saw deceased in the river about two yards from the side he got a boat hook and pulled the body out and waited until assistance arrived 
A verdict Dad. found drowned probably by accident was returned. I think that was a nice way, really, because <laughs> to me it sounds as though he actually did himself in. But that's another thing. And those are to remind me where I'm going. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? Anyway, this one, to my mind, is one of the most amusing ones that we have. If you can say that death is amusing. And it's of Henry Dalton, who died November the 17th, 1892, aged 82 years. And, um, oh sorry, just a second. Um, Ellen's drowning case. And this is lost his life in the fog. There are depressing features in connection with the death of Henry Dalton, aged 82, of Elizabeth Street, Elland. At the coroner's inquiry held by Mr Barstow at the Halifax Infirmary on Saturday evening, evidence was adducted to the effect that Dalton, who won his living as a basket maker, was found in the Calder and Hebel Canal at Salter Hebel early on Friday morning. He was seen by a servant of Messrs. Holdsworth's the night before proceeding along the towpath and it is surmised that in the fog he walked into the water. Oh dear. <laughs> Owing to his extreme age he walked with a stooping attitude. <laughs> there was nothing to show that he had come to his death through foul means. The verdict was death probably accidentally falling into the canal in dense fog. <laughs> <laughs> He yeah. should, you know, shouldn't laugh really, but it's uh, quite amusing. But um, and there, I can't take you to show you, but it's right over in the far corner. And this um, here, we have uh, an illustration of it, and it is um, Herm Herbert S. Booth at this. Mm -hmm. And it, he was called Herbert Shackleton Booth, and he died on the 30th of March 1877. And it says a fatal accident in Manchester. On Saturday, an inquest was held by the city coroner, Mr. E. Hereford, on the body of Herbert Shackleton Booth, aged 45. A clerk, uh, uh, he was a clerk and late of 18 Clarence Street, Hardwick, Manchester, who was killed at Victoria Railway Station on Friday night last. He was knocked down by a train as he was attempting to cross the lines contrary to the rules. <laughs> the jury returned a verdict of accidental death. So, it, again, 1877, that's fairly early in the days of the railways, and probably people weren't really aware of, of how they should behave in a railway station. And if you go to Victoria Railway Station today, which I'm going next week, I think it is, it's quite open. It, you know, you can imagine that, that um, it would be fairly easy to do that. with a plaque under it that is planted for the, um, the Queen's Jubilee when she uh, just before she died we planted that tree there and then the weeping tree over there that is a, a weeping cherry that we planted for the King's coronation and and just further down there the tree um, that's a new tree we've put in and that is for peace this cemetery is a member of the significant association of, of cemeteries in Europe. It's in the top 100 cemeteries in Europe. And all the cemeteries in that group have planted a tree for peace. So we've got trees for peace in, in Paris, Milan, um, Croatia, all over Europe. Every country in Europe, they've got a tree for peace planted. Mm. Here is George, the beloved son of Scaife and Sarah Horner. Wonderful name, Scaife. Um, and uh, he was an 18-year-old lad, I think, yeah, 17 actually, in the 18th year of his age. And um, 
a fatal mill accident. On Wednesday, a mechanic named George Horner, employed at Dean Clough Mills, met with a serious accident while at work. He was endeavouring to pick some waste off a planing machine when on its return motion he was struck by a bracket on his leg and ab abdomen. His thigh was broken and his abdomen, abdomen so severely injured that but little hope is entertained for his recovery. He was removed to the infirmary. The poor man died on Thursday. Yesterday evening an inquest was held on the infirmary by Mr. Barstow, the newly appointed deputy coroner, and a verdict of accidental death was returned. The deceased lived in Brinton Terrace, and this was, he died on the 7th of May, 1869. So, um, he's talking about a man, but he was 17, so he, he tells you a bit again about the, the age uh, of, you know, in the 1800s, what they thought about the age of people. Uh, one is James Earnshaw. Unfortunately, there's no stone, but this is where he is buried. We know where everybody in this cemetery is buried, all 20,000 of them. Uh, we know exactly the position they're in. So um, I can assure you that he's in here. On the 20th of uh, September, 1877, and it was a shocking accident in the Beacon Hill Tunnel. At the Station Hotel on Tuesday, Mr Hill, Deputy Coroner, held an inquest on the body of James Earnshaw, 31, whose death occurred on Saturday night. The circumstances are as follows. The deceased was employed as a night watchman on the Beacon Hill Tunnel and went on his duties as usual on Saturday evening. He and the other watchman, named William Randall, were placed about 70 yards distance from each other and each had a fire. Earnshaw was last seen alive by Randall at around 11 o'clock at night. Towards 2am the following morning, Randall noticed that Earnshaw's fire was getting low and called out but received no answer. He then went up to the place and found Earnshaw dead on the forefoot, which is the old name for a railway line. Uh, having been run over by a passing train, the man had a severe cut behind the right ear, which has <laughs> been run over by a train. I think that's a bit more than severe cut. Uh, the jury returned a verdict of accidentally killed by a passing train. Now it just makes you wonder why on earth did they have watchmen in the tunnels? I, I just couldn't understand that. And we're standing in here where there are no stones, this is where there are a lot of public graves. And in a single grave cut in these public graves, you'll quite often find 30 bodies. So there are a lot, there's about 2,000 people in this section here. There's no record of them, and you know, uh, they are forgotten people in effect. So what we are going to do this autumn is we're going to flood this whole area with uh, daffodil bulbs. And we've got the West Riding Stone Carvers Association. They are creating um, a monument that we can put on here to, to remember these forgotten people. We can't name them all, of course, but we are going to remember them as a whole. These were called public graves, they were never called pauper's graves, which is a nicer term in my view. So it's um, going to be really nice in the spring. We're going to have, as I say, daffodils and snowdrops and all sorts of things like that. No cross burrows. It's quite an unusual name. Now, the the death that I'm going to talk about today is probably related to, to his death, but it's not actually the cause of his death. On the 27th of January 1859, highway robbery near Halifax on the 29th of November 18... 
sorry, highway robbery near Halifax on the 29th of November 1856. But Norcross died on the 27th of January 1859, so it's a couple of years later. However, shortly after six o'clock on Thursday night, Mr. Norcross Burroughs, a printer of Halifax, was attacked and robbed on the highway near Bradshaw, a short distance from uh, a short distance from the town, by three men having their faces faces blackened. Now, whether they whether they had masks on or whether it was just charcoal or do whatever. <laughs> Mr Burroughs is a shareholder in a new mill recently built at Bradshaw Lane and has be, been in practice to go to the mill every Thursday, sometimes with considerable amounts of money, to pay the contractors. He was proceeding to the mill on Thursday night on horseback and had arrived as far as the junction formed by the roads leading to Illingworth Moor and Bradshaw Lane, when he encountered the three men. One of them knocked him backwards over his horse and he alighted upon his head on the road. The other two held him by his arms and attempted to strangle him with his scarf, whilst the man who knocked him down was held, uh, held his hands over his eyes and rifled the contents of his pockets which fortunately consisted of a few shillings, some keys and a knife. Disappointed at finding their booty so small, the ruffians brutally kicked him in the side, blood flowed from his mouth, nose and ears, and he called for assistance, and his assailants were about to give him another kick when they heard the sound of approaching footsteps and ran off. Mr Burroughs then attempted to remount his horse, which was quietly grazing a little distance away. But the saddle girths had been cut, and on putting his foot in the stirrup, he fell to the ground. He was very badly injured, but it is hoped not fatally. But um, when he was in his 30, 32 or something, and he got a good beating like that, it just makes it we wonder if that was partly the cause of his death mm. and he's buried here. Hartley, I've not got a lot about him. George but, uh, Hartley. It's, he died on the 18th of August 1882. Yesterday morning, John, George Hartley, a wool stapler of Stirling Street, Halifax, who had long been ailing, committed <laughs> suicide by hanging himself by a handkerchief to the bedpost of his bedroom. He was 62 years old. Now, <laughs> how do you hang yourself by a handkerchief from a bedpost? Now, it's, it's not the only case because we've got one further up there. Uh, a guy that was um, an American gentleman and he'd come over here and he was depressed and he hung himself by a handkerchief off a bedpost. So they must have had very different beds or very they different handkerchiefs in those days. Poster, I'm, I'm guessing. Well, I, I just don't understand it. I've been a magician. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, the, some of the things that you see as you're going around it and read, you know, you're thinking that doesn't make sense. How are they going to do that? On the 23rd of February, Robert Nutter. And he actually fought at the Battle of Waterloo. He was in the Blues and Royals, which was one of the very fancy brigades that you see around Buckingham Palace, sort of thing, on the um, during the parade. And he actually fought at Waterloo. His great 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 grandson um, is called Fred Shelley, who lives in Australia, and he has been here and put. Um, uh, Robert's Waterloo Medal actually on the grave and we've got photographs of it. Waterloo Medals are very valuable medals. And this is Wilfred, son of Han Sam and Batty, Sam Batty Man. I, I love his name even, <laughs> but when you look at it, um, also Hannah, wife of the above Sam Batty Man, also Margaret his wife, also Mary Hannah his wife, also a Mary Jane, his wife. <laughs> Four wives. And, it, uh, and then he died when he was 83 years old, so he must have 
had a good life. Yes. But the thing, uh, first of all, you think, well, was he murdering them for, his, for the money? <laughs> but obviously, uh, I've done quite a bit of research and I can't find that any of them had any money. So <laughs> it, it, you, they didn't seem to last long anyway, let's put it that way. He must have not liked them and decided, <laughs> well, I don't know. We've got Joe Bentley, it's four years and eight months, son of Job Emma Bentley of this town, who on returning from school on the 24th of May 1860 was instantly killed by a fall of planks carelessly piled in Delft Street. Now, the, there's a few things there. Joe, he was um, four years and eight months, and he was coming home from school by himself. In in those days, you can't imagine that children of that age would be going to school for one thing. But then, if you look at this, uh, the carelessly is written in, in italics. Now, Joe's father, Job Bentley, was the, in effect, the corridor of the town. And he's really placing blame on the builders by putting it like that. He's pointing the finger very that's the Weeping Willow, the... Uh, oh, that one, man. Yeah. Uh, see how, you know, uh, that's a sign of grief. Uh, oh, uh, and he's uh, remembering the Roman funerary urns. Yeah. And the veil is there, the veil between life and death is mm. very close. And that is where the saying gone to pot has come from. Mm -hmm. no. Anyway, sorry, that, um, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. William Lord of Shell here. After dinner, he had gone into the garden to pick a few cherries from a tree which stood in front of the house. He stood on a flagstone fence and slipped, falling with his neck against the fence and breaking the vertebrae. He died around 6 a.m. the following morning. <laughs> so don't go in your garden trying to pick cherries on the top of a stone wall. <coughs> right now then, we're, we're, as we're here, you can see there's a rhododendron tree there and there's a couple, oh that's one as well. Let me look at that. Um, this is uh, not actually buried in this cemetery but it's related to the cemetery. George Francis O'Hara, a bo boy's uh, tree fall accident tragically occurred on the 18th of April 1967. So this is after the cemetery was closed. The death of George Francis O'Hara, son of Mr and Mrs Joseph O'Hara of 30 Raglan Street, Halifax, which is just on there, um, was described as a particularly tragic accident by the Halifax District Coroner, Mr. B. W. Little OBE, when he recorded a verdict of accidental death at the inquest today. The boy died after falling from a tree in Lister Lane Cemetery, Gibber Street, on the 18th of April. Mr. Joseph O'Hara said that his son was fond of all kinds of children's activities. He broke his collarbone nine months ago when he fell off a wall at Pelham Lane School, but he's made a good recovery. <laughs> Eight-year-old Paul Lawn said that he had been playing with George when the accident occurred. George had climbed up one side of the tree and the other uh, and he the other side, but when George reached the top of the tree, a branch broke and he fell. Paul said he ran across the road to get help for him. Now, uh, just up there was where the the infirmary was, where the workhouse was, and uh, so that's where he went. And staff, staff nurse Margaret Rose Buckley said she was in the porter's office at St John's Hospital just after 5pm when a boy came in and said that a boy had fallen from a tree in the cemetery. She said the boy, uh, she found the boy still hanging from the tree by his jumper. She lifted him down and gave him mouth to mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came to take him to the Halifax Royal Infirmary. 
Detective Sergeant Donald Fotherby said that the boy had fallen from a rhododendron bush. Uh, he found a broken branch five foot from the ground and another about two foot from the ground. There were bloodstains running at the base of the lower branch to the ground. It seems as though the boy had fallen backwards from the top branch and caught his head on the lower branch, said the sergeant. Dr Roger G Pyra, the pathologist at St James's Hospital Leeds, said that the boy had an oval cut before, below his left ear, a piece of wood was in the muscle at the base of the skull and this had severed the spinal cord, causing almost instant death. <laughs> The coroner said that it was in the nature of small healthy boys to climb trees. It had been established that the boy's death had been a pure accident. Oh dear. Uh, almost like a path of all these stones that are laid side by side. They were actually all at Square Chapel. And uh, when there were some road improvements being made, they were all taken up. They had been taken up to Stony Wright Cemetery with the intent of breaking them up but we said, you're not going to do that, we'll have them. So they were all put down there now. But the, the beauty of it is that the burial records for Square Chapel have all been lost. So these stones are the only record that there is of the people that were uh, in Square, uh, buried in Square Chapel. So it's a really important resource. What happened to the body? They, they were uh, taken up to Stony Royd, just yeah, in a big pit sort of thing. Yeah. That we have put in because uh, Adrian Smith was one of our uh, helpers and he sadly passed away. Uh, but he was really interested in Dan Milton who was uh, again a guy that fought at Waterloo. And this is a public grave, and in this grave there are 30 bodies. So there was a Waterloo veteran just dumped in next to... Um, uh, there was a young girl that was the daughter of a, a sergeant in the militia as well, and several other people. But in those days, they just buried them. It was a waste disposal system almost, and it was the next body in. So you'd have a man next to a woman, next to a child, next to a Catholic, to a Protestant or whatever. It was just a question of somewhere to get rid of bodies. Uh, we, we're told that the, some of the graves are around about 27 feet deep, which they must be, if you think about 30 mm -hmm. people and, and uh, depth of the coffin. Now whether they put, I, I suspect they use lime and whatever, to try and uh, reduce it down as quickly as possible, but with no evidence of that. Uh, wife of James Elizabeth. Heath, Halifax, and also James Heath. Now, James uh, was a grocer, but he had a sideline and it was burying people. A approximately a third of the people that are buried in this cemetery were buried by James Heath who was a grocer and um, he was a sort of a uh, one of these people that didn't do religious services as such and he for people that didn't believe or whatever or couldn't afford a lot either because he was very cheap he was rather than a preacher man who won't charge a lot he didn't charge much. and, and uh, but, And on the same day that his uh, daughter was buried, he did the service of, um, of a child in the cemetery. Basically, for 16 years, he buried one person a day for 16 years. This is, uh, in this grave here, there's no stone, unfortunately. But this was Wooler Jenkinson, his surname was Wooler, which is quite unusual, on the 26th of uh, July 1855. And a Halifax thunderstorm, loss of two lives. 
On a Wednesday, an inquest was held at the Crown and Anchor uh, Inn on the body of Wooler Jenkins. The unfortunate man was drowned whilst trying to take out a plank of wood from the brook uh, and he was carried away by the stream whilst doing so. Apparently there was a, um, a plank of wood that was blocking the uh, Hebel Brook and slowing the uh, flow down and he was trying to get it out. And the body of the deceased was found by a man called Hanson of Siddle Hall. He, uh, he, with a great difficulty, succeeded in drawing the body to the edge of the water, which he found dreadfully cut and bruised. None of his clothing being left on, but a portion of his shirt, which was turned over the head, and some portion of stockings. Can you uh, just imagine that? The jury, after a short, short consultation, frowned a verdict of accidentally drowned. Now, uh, in the same event, uh, at the same time, there was a little boy called, I can't remember his first name, but he was definitely Wilkinson, a, a young lad, and he was uh, in the cellar of his grandma's house, and he was drowned as well when a, a wall collapsed because of the water. So, yeah. Mm. And the Elms Ailes is further down. Right, this one, this is a, an interesting one to me anyway. Isaiah, son of John and Sarah Rushworth of Mount Pillen, who died November 1863, aged 28 years, after two and a half years' service in the Federal Army of America. Mm -hmm. Also of the above, uh, Sarah Rushworth. Now, in those days, apparently, if you joined the Federal Army of America, you could get instant um, citizenship of America if you were fighting for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably he, he did that to, to, so that he would get freedom. Barker. Sarah and Barker. <coughs> Sarah Ann Barker, who was quite interesting because she died in 1919 and yet she was present at all the Peace Hall scenes. Now in the, the Peace Hall, every five years on Whit Sunday, they had a sing and there were quite often 30, up to 30,000 people in the Peace Hall from Sunday schools and whatever singing um, psalms and all that sort of thing and from all the local Sunday schools and, and churches and Sarah Ann Barker attended every one of them and she died when she was 94 <laughs> well, she, her first one she was six years old when she attended and she was from Lightcliff and she was telling how they walked from Lightcliff to, when she was six years old walking from Lightcliff to the Peace Hall in a long dress and it was steaming hot summer and you know just yeah, yeah. 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 the names some of the names that we have in the cemetery are quite interesting this one here is Honest Forius <laughs> Honest Forius Riley good name that isn't it who died in 1908. I don't know what he's, they would probably call him one or something. Yeah. Can't, <laughs> I can't imagine on this for you. Ain't it? Well, I've never noticed that one. Oh, rough. I have <laughs> oh, oh. Thomas Battle. Uh, yeah. Thomas Battle. Battle. Now, he was an interesting Battle. guy <laughs> because um, not only had he got an odd name, he was from Shropshire and the reason that I picked him up was that he married a girl called Elizabeth and she was from Huddersfield. He was from Shropshire and yet they married in Manchester Cathedral and I couldn't understand why uh, a girl from Huddersfield would marry somebody in Manchester Cathedral. All turns out that he was a trooper and he was 
fighting to stop the riots in Manchester at the time and uh, the lot in Manchester they were rioting all the time you know as they still do probably <laughs> but they um, so the troops were there the next thing is he was on the boat going out to Australia guarding the convicts going out to Australia he then spent a considerable time in Australia and he had a couple of children with his wife because he went out with his wife on board the board boat spent uh, a few children in Australia the next thing is he's on the boat going to India to fight the Sikhs and he has a couple of children in India he then come, came back as a Chelsea pensioner and he set up as the landlord of the Isle of Skye Inn which is right up on the very tops of the moors between Meltham, Holmfirth and Greenfield it's as high up as you can get at Wesendon Head and he was the landlord there for quite a while but the beauty of it, the reason that I know so much about him was that he was always getting done for serving beer at, when the religious services were on for gambling and, and all sorts of things because it was an ideal spot really for it and um, another thing is as well it was a popular place for people to go walking on a Sunday so you would get a report in the newspaper saying how um, the group from Holmfirth had walked up to Mr Batho's house, uh, public house and it was a wonderful day and uh, they had some marvellous food and um, it was served by uh, the landlord's wife Elizabeth who was sweating profusely as she served the food <laughs> it said in the paper uh, anyway the ne next thing is um, he, he got he lost his license they eventually got fed up of his misbehavior so he came to Halifax to take up a job as a tailor which was what he was before he went in the army and he served in, in Halifax. So that's why he's buried here. And his wow. daughter Emma, em, I think Emma was born in Australia, and oh. Hannah Maria was born in India, I think it was from memory. Wow. So they're quite, and they're buried in here. Wow. Oh, look at that life, yeah. The other thing is, of course, thinking about it, in those days, it would take six months more or less to get from here yeah. to so Australia on board yeah. boat, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is uh, <coughs> James Ernest Ben this is another sad death that you can see James Ernest, son of Ernest and Emma Ben uh, born 18th of October 1899 died 5th of May 1914 now Ben's are a removal company in mm. Halifax mm. and I believe they're still, still yeah. going and he was a 14 year old lad on a bicycle and he cycled to Leeds and he was overtaking a tram when there was a tram coming in the other direction <laughs> and bicycles and trams don't like one another and he was killed um, by, by that but again in 1914 for a, a lad to be cycling over to, uh, over to Leeds Mm. I do hope you enjoyed that to two of you, so as you can see on here, there's another plaque showing you all the different uh, categories uh, of, of people, and also the uh, um, graves of some famous ones, such as the Crossleys. As many of you know, we have a famous uh, building society in Halifax, or a bank that started in bank, and these are some of the people who founded uh, the the bank. Nazrin Halifax, Joelski, a banking system, a building society, kete, uske founders, be yaha, and dafnae wehe. So viewers, I do hope that you found that uh, interesting. So as I say, it's history on our doorstep and it's always interesting to uh, 
uh, you know, for me it's very interesting anyway to be uh, watching or being part of such, such things. I know the video is a, a little bit long, but I do hope you will watch it fully. And uh, well, obviously, if, as I always say, if not fully uh, in one go, then in, in chunks, please. Nazreen no meede aapko ye video pasand aayi hogi. Ye mere liye ye bahut tarikhi hai ki ye hamara ye ilaka hai aur yahan ye kya ke history hai. To please, please, I know. Mujhe malum hai ki bahut lambi video hogi ye, magar thode thode hisse mein isse mukammal dekhiye ka aur baaki jo playlist se unko bhi dekhiye ka. Uh, progress again rather slow so please help me whatever way that you can by playing the videos fully and playing uh, the uh, playlist so we're going to end the video there viewers until the next time i say thank you for watching please keep watching look after yourselves goodbye nazreen apna khayal rakhna dusron ka khayal rakhna duaon mein yaad rakhna allah hafiz